When you mentioned Antarctica, I, I immediately thought of pole shifting. And that's mm. become a big topic lately. Um, I'd love yeah. to get your thoughts because some of these ancient maps show Antarctica with no ice. That's right. It's a, it's an issue that I went into in Fingerprints of the Gods uh, in the most depth. Um, and I definitely owe the fact that I got into that at all uh, to the work of a number of scholars. Um, Rand and Rose Flemath, uh, and behind them, Charles Hapgood, uh, and their work on Charles Hapgood's work uh, was of particular interest to me. Uh, it raised the extraordinary possibility that the that the crust of the Earth might might from time to time shift in one piece, uh, and the the image we're asked to call to mind is of a a nice luscious orange, you know, with a thick peel. And, and somehow some force causes that thick peel to rotate around the fruit. So if that's the earth and that thick peel is the crust of the earth, then it would be conceivable that Antarctica could be in a tropical zone and could be shifted by an earth crust displacement into a freezing Antarctic zone. Um, and that, that's, the, that's the notion of earth crust displacement, which, which, which the fundamental credit belongs to Charles Hapgood. He was the first person who investigated this. And Charles Hapgood also must be credited for his work on ancient maps. Uh, and, and I highly recommend to anybody listening to this, the maps, maps of the ancient sea kings uh, by Charles Hapgood. This is a fantastic book and it's a very deep investigation of the mystery of these, these ancient maps based on, on older source maps. Now, what happened after Fingerprints of the Gods was I was increasingly unable to find evidence that confirmed, that would really confirm that Antarctica had been shifted from a tropical into a, in, into a freezing zone. I, I, within, perhaps if we go back hundreds of millions of years, yes, but within the lifetime of the human species, I, I found it very difficult to find that confirming, confirming evidence. And I began to wonder what, I, what fundamentally I was looking at, and this was the heart of fingerprints of the gods really was was a stupendous global cataclysm that occurred around twelve and a half thousand years ago, about ten thousand five hundred b c in our calendar and at the time when I was writing fingerprints of the gods, I thought earth crust displacement uh, provided a very interesting and very plausible explanation for that um, i haven 't completely rejected that idea uh, I added to it um, in uh, an appendix to Magicians of the Gods, I think, and, and also in an article on my website by Flavio Barbiero. Uh, Flavio is, a, is an ex-Italian uh, uh, Navy admiral, um, and he makes a strong case that a glancing blow from a comet uh, on the crust of the Earth could cause a, a displacement effect. Uh, rather, as described by by Hapgood, so I haven't completely let that idea go, but I began to look for other ideas, uh, which might which might also account for my fundamental issue, which was a global cataclysm memorialized in the traditions of the Great Flood and of darkness and of a great freeze that came upon the world, and that's when I became aware of the work of the Comet Research Group and the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. My focus had always been on the Younger Dryas. 12,500 years ago is right near the beginning of the Younger Dryas, this bizarre climate episode when until 12,800 years ago, the world had been coming out of the Ice Age and then suddenly, boom, it went back into a radical deep freeze and you have this wide-scale extinctions of, of Ice Age megafauna uh, all around the world and, and clear disruption of, of, of human populations as well. So my focus was on that period Anyway, and here now was a group of very well-credentialed mainstream scientists, not writing in the 1950s or 1960s, but writing in the 2000s, uh, presenting papers in, in highly regarded journals, uh, making the case that uh, the Earth was struck by a comet swarm uh, around 12,800 years ago. And by that I mean, and what they mean, uh, is that uh, it's a typical behavior of comets to break up into multiple fragments particularly when they enter the gravitational field of a, of, of a star uh, or of a large planet. 
Uh, and and uh, we all saw that with Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 in uh, 1994, which broke up into 21 pieces before it hit Jupiter. Um, and, and the argument of the Comet Research Group, the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, is that a very large uh, interstellar comet, or certainly a comet that had come out of the, the Oort cloud very far away uh, from, from the center of our solar system, entered the central solar system about 20,000 years ago. This object, they think, might have been as much as 100 kilometers in diameter. Very dangerous if it were to hit the Earth directly. Uh, but instead what it did was it began to break up, as all comets do, into multiple, multiple fragments, some being quite large, a kilometer or two, in some cases five or six kilometers in diameter, like Comet Enki, which is still part of the remnant of this, um, and, and uh, some much smaller, just, just dust, dust particles. And the argument is that what we call the Torrid meteor stream today is the remnant of that disintegrating comet. And the further argument is that that meteor stream 12,800 years ago bombarded the Earth. That the Earth, we still pass through the Torrid meteor stream twice a year. We were passing through it twice a year 12,800 years ago as well. Um, there are lumpy big bits in it as well as small dust bits in it. And the argument of the Comet Research Group is we encountered some of those lumpy big bits around 12,800 years ago. Most of them blew up in the atmosphere. They didn't hit the Earth. They were air bursts. Uh, you, 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 which which don't leave a detectable crater, um, like the Tunguska event in 1908 over Russia, that was an airburst of a of a, a meteorite fragment, quite probably from the Torrid meteor stream. It occurred on the 30th of June 1908. That's the peak of the Beta Torrids. Uh, entered the Earth's atmosphere and exploded at an altitude of a few kilometers above, fortunately, an, an, an uninhabited area of Siberia, um, flattening 2,000 square miles of trees in the process. Were that to have happened over a major city, it would have been a cataclysm on a horrific scale. Um, but it's a kind of warning of what can happen again and it's the suggestion of what happened 12,800 years ago, that there may have been hundreds of, of objects of that kind of size that blew up in the atmosphere, as well as a number that hit primarily the North, what was then the North American ice cap and the Northern European ice cap. But the majority of it was air bursts of objects that might have been less than 200 meters in diameter, which didn't have enough power to hit the Earth, but which blew up in the sky with the force of 20, 50, 100 Hiroshima's. Uh, and not just one of them, but many, many of them all over the world. All the way you can track the Younger Dryas boundary, all the way from the west coast of the United States, as far east as Syria, uh, and the site of Abu Huraira in Syria, which, by the way, is, is only a few hundred kilometers from Gobekli Tepe in, in, in Turkey. Uh, so so, so this, became, this became, to me, uh, a matter worthy of further investigation and a matter worth reporting on. Uh, so I've since I became aware of the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, I've been focusing on that. I haven't completely abandoned or thrown away Earth crust displacement. It's there. I never go back and rewrite my past books. Fingerprints of the Gods is exactly the same book that it was in 1995. It might have a new introduction or a new postscript, but that's that's it. The basic text remains the same. Um, my position remains the same. My work is there for people to read and make up their own minds on, uh, and hopefully do their own further research on. Um, I, I hope in, f for those who wish to pour scorn on my work, which they're welcome to do, that they would at least actually read it. Well, I I'm wondering about these pole shifts. Do you think it happens instantly or is this a gradual thing? Well, look, there's, again, there's, there's a confusion here because they make, there's magnetic pole shifts do not necessarily mean geophysical pole shifts. The fact that the magnetic pole can flip 180 degrees doesn't mean that the Earth's turning upside down. It's a, it's, it's a magnetic shift. Now, is the Earth's magnetic field connected in some way to its rotation? I would say pretty likely it is. Pretty likely it is. So perhaps magnetic pole shifts are accompanied by physical events, which don't just affect the needle on our compass, but, but which uh, affect the world we, we live in. Um, but but the the argument that Hapgood put forward uh, in um, Earth's shifting crust uh, was that it was the result of the buildup of ice 
the asymmetrical buildup of ice in certain areas during the Ice Age uh, in North America and Northern Europe, which caused this, which caused the whole global sphere to become unbalanced and led to pressure on the crust that led to the movement of the crust. That that was Hapgood's that was Hapgood's argument. Um, but it was and and therefore it was it was something to answer your question. It was it was something that built up slowly but happened suddenly. It reached it, it reached a, a point of potential where it could happen, and then it, the event was very quick, uh, literally overnight. It would have been were that to have happened, global tsunamis, massive weather effects, the the effect of a of a true pole shift uh, would be cataclysmic beyond belief. Um, I like to leave that question open. Uh, since certainly 2013, my work has been focused on the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, which is, again, it's important to stress, is, is a hypothesis, not, not a fact, you know. What's a fact? What we, what we do seem to know for sure uh, is that there was a very weird climate episode between 12,800 years ago and 11,600 years ago. And that's the episode called the Younger Dryas. And the mainstream view is that it was caused by um, the melting of ice dams on glacial lakes on the great ice caps of North America and, North e and Northern Europe, and that the floodwaters entered the world ocean and stopped the global meridional overturning circulation in its tracks. Best known part of that is the Gulf Stream, which is part of the central heating system of our planet. And, you know, I think they're right about that. I think the, the cutting of the, of the global water circulation was key to the sudden plunge in temperatures that took place at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. But the question is rarely asked is, is really, is that melting of ice dams, that breaking of ice dams on glacial lakes, is that enough to explain what happened? Uh, or are we not looking at are we not looking, what's the cause behind that? Why, why did that happen? Why did it happen all at once so suddenly? And that's where the Comet Research Group, with its, with its argument for impacts of substantial fragments, not airbursts, but impacts of substantial fragments on the North American ice cap, which was then two kilometers deep, that that argument helps to explain that sudden gush of freezing meltwater into the world ocean which then caused the, the sudden plunge in temperatures. So the, the, those two ideas aren't nece necessarily mutually exclusive. And then there's another idea, and, and all tribute to geologist to Robert Schock here. Robert Schock, as we know, has, has done incredibly important work on the Great Sphinx and, you know, has, has stuck his neck out and taken all the risks that you have to take in this field in order to, in order to present evidence that the mainstream don't like, uh, evidence that the Great Sphinx is thousands of years older than Egyptologists claim. Uh, and I have huge respect and, and admiration for Robert Schock's work in that field. Now, Robert, brilliant scientist, has come up with another suggestion. Uh, for, for the Younger Dryas climate weirdness. Uh, he attributes it to solar outbursts. Maybe he's right. You know, in many cases, the evidence for solar outbursts and the evidence for comet impacts in the form of proxies is rather similar. Uh, maybe both are possible. Maybe it was a comet impact at the beginning of the Younger Dryas and a massive solar outburst at the end of the Younger Dryas. Um, I, you, you know, it's an open question. But what we do have is very clear evidence that the planet did pass through a, a cataclysmic event in that 1,200 year period between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And the extinction record of megafauna alone uh, is enough to bear witness to how bad that was. <laughs> 